<laughs> Real quick, oh, sorry. Ben is a silent film accompanist. That is his day job, which is just so freaking cool to me. It is so cool. And and so, but his moonlighting job <laughs> is being the um, archivist, the official archivist for Edie Adams and Ernie Kovacs material. And so we are so glad to have him here. This is first time in Dallas, and his first time with the with. A, being here for uh, obviously for the Dallas Video Fest, Ernie Kovacs Award, and then we have Josh Mills, and Josh is the son of Edie Adams, who, before he was born, and the reason why his name isn't Kovacs is because he wasn't born yet. Anyway, <laughs> so she was married to to Ernie Kovacs, and he is the keeper of the flame, basically. Uh, it's a, yeah. That's how I always say it. I run the archive too. Yes, he runs the archive and he knows all the family history, the family stories. Ben is an encyclopedic <laughs> mind of, okay, what was going on in February 3rd, 1952? Ben will say, Yeah, it's <laughs> well, kind of like Rain Man with Ernie Cola. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, not that much. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to start with the two of them. And I would really like to start by you telling us, first of all, yes. tell us how the collection came to be, because that is a story in and of itself that oh, yeah. we need to know. Okay. And then I want I want you to tell your story okay. of how you got connected with yeah. this. Okay, sure. <coughs> but, but, yeah, yeah, after, okay. first thing. Uh, so I guess we'll start at Ernie's death. Uh, start that off. Uh, so he died in 62, January 62, and about 1963, my mom got a phone call from someone on Ernie's tech crew and said, I just want you to know that I'm working here at NBC and they're using Ernie's masters for weather reports and PSAs and commercials and they're wiping his masters. So my mom, uh, who was in deep debt, when Ernie died he left her about half a million dollars in debt. Uh, my mom took some insurance money and she basically got a lawyer to get a quick claim and said, if it says Kovacs, buy it. So in 1963, my mom figured out that there was a purpose for Ernie's career, his genius, and so we amassed an archive of like, I don't know, 1,000 elements, 1,600 elements, something crazy. That's a lot. Um, and so she put them away in a storage facility called Beacons, then it became a place called Bonded. Now it's at uh, the Library of Congress, so it's preserved forever, it's never going away. Uh, ben was instrumental in that. It's your tax dollars at work. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but my mom really sort of, you know, I talk to people all the time who run libraries and they basically said, you know, if there was a Preservationist Hall of Fame, your mom was a first ballot inductee. Like, nobody <laughs> did that. 221, Cliff 221. Cliff. <laughs> I swear that's not us. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> Cliff? Um, so that's how the, that's how it exists. A lot of early television, as you know, is, you know, lost. Uh, all the New York Tonight shows are gone. Um, you know, things like that just don't exist anymore, so we got really lucky and actually have an archive. Yeah. Um, in 1996, at the dawn of the internet, we were, when we were getting AOL CDs in the mail every other day, uh, I was very interested in, in websites and that sort of thing, and was uh, at a temp job and, and downtime notice, was just going surfing around as much as you could on InfoSeek. Uh, and notice there was no Ernie Kovacs fan site. And would you hold my calls, please? Uh, and I taught myself. And basically, I I put up an Ernie Kovacs fan site, figuring, gosh, I hope I nobody makes me take this down. I didn't clear anything. And three months later, I get an e e there we go. I get an email from I get an email from Josh Mills. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Mills. I'm Edie Adams' son. My mom found your website. She <laughs> loves it. And then I got an email from Edie Adams. Um, and we, she and I struck up a, 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 an email and telephone uh, correspondence and friendship, and we talked by phone. And I got to meet her in 2004 at uh, the, uh, the Buster Keaton conference in Iola, Kansas, where they were uh, saluting Ernie Kovacs' work. And, uh, Ironically, the, one of the very last things that Kovacs did was a, a television pilot for a Western uh, uh, that was starring, that starred Kovacs and Buster Keaton. Um, wow. So that's, that's how I, and then at, at, at the time, 
uh, after Edie passed, um, Josh brought me on uh, to just sort of, uh, there were two things going. One is we were starting to work on the first DVD box set that came out, uh, which I helped, uh, well, I curated it or programmed it, just chose all the stuff that would be on it, and, and just uh, to just take uh, charge of dealing with all the, all the elements that were at, at Bonded, and then through my relationship with the Library of Congress. I'm a silent film accompanist. I'm a resident film accompanist at Library of Congress. And through my playing there every couple of months, I learned about their practice of acquiring collections. And uh, this, this way, the collection would be re-inventoried re uh, by the Library of Congress, during which process we discovered there's a whole lot of shows that we didn't realize were there. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that was early kinescopes that have never been scanned. Um, and it's being taken care of uh, and at the library, and, 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 and the, yeah, right, and the, the, exactly. And there's all these audio transcription discs that are there now uh, as well. And those are those are, you know, you mentioned uh, your, your mom and preservation. And she, she, it wasn't just like right after Ernie passed that there are these audio transcription discs that are just basic audio air checks of television shows because nobody was kinescoping the shows. And Edie, who had initially had these made so she could hear herself sing pop songs in the early 50s, realized, oh, nobody's saving this show, and kept having this made. Uh, so the discs that survive are the only record of a lot of the shows from 1952, 53, 54, and 55. Uh, the Dumont era show that ran for a little over a year, uh, almost all the kidneys were dumped in the Hudson River. But oh. we have these discs. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how would you best, but I'm going to hear from both of you, yeah. how would you best describe Bernie's humor and kind of, well, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. in two words, no, no, yeah. no, no, not really, but, but describe, describe who he is to an audience that may not, that may be like, I don't know, who this is this. Uh, well, I can tell you what he wasn't. Okay. <laughs> um, he wasn't uh, a comedian that did stand up. He never did stand up. Yeah. He didn't really have a radio show that translated to television and became, you know, uh, a radio show with a set. Um, he basically figured out that there was, I think his biggest thing was that he realized that you were going into people's homes and you were a guest in their house and they better like you. Because if they don't like you, they're going to change the channel, even though they're only three. Um, and so uh, he had a set of, I think he, his, his biggest contribution was his visuals. He basically figured out that there was a way that television worked that other mediums didn't, and he did a lot of visual gags. Of course, he had characters, Matza Heppelwhite, uh, Percy Dove Tonsils, and Aerobi Trio, um, but I think he really figured out that there was a language that uh, was not being, that, that no one had ever seen before, and he just exploited the visual part of it. Yeah, and his, he was this creative uh, fountain. He was constantly writing. Uh, he wrote for the Trentonian, uh, the Trent, New Jersey newspaper, uh, in the, his hometown, uh, and that translated in, in, into his doing. Uh, you know, he was an actor and he stru uh, studied acting and wound up working in radio for several years. And would he was supposed to just play records, but he would do fake commercials and skits and stuff like that. And people loved what they were hearing. And he built up this following, and he, his his humor was, you know, when you got when you tuned in to listen to Ernie, you got you got what you got was Ernie. It, like like you said, it's hard to describe what the humor was, and it wasn't set up punchline, set up punchline. And there's nothing you can say. Oh, it's like this. There, it's just like Ernie Kovacs. Um, there's a great quote from Jack Lemmon in a in a documentary called Tele uh, Ernie Kovacs Television's Original Genius, where he said, Ernie had what what. Jack Lemmon considered a true sense of humor. He said, we often say that people have a sense of humor, but what we mean is that they have an appreciation of a sense of humor. But Ernie really had a sense of what was funny and what would be funny to other people. Um, and the other thing is that Kovacs had this idea, and it might have come from his days on the radio, that you, you were, you were uh, broadcasting to an audience of one. So he would do talk into the camera as if you were right across from him. And his television shows feel like visits, like you're having a visit with him. But he, 
like, like Josh said, he realized you were looking at a little box in your living room or, or wherever you had your set. And from the beginning was looking at other ways you could do things visually. Uh, took a soup can and then a tomato paste can and a prism or a mirror and stuck it on the front of the lens to make it look like the picture was upside down so he could look like he's vacuuming off the ceiling. <laughs> he took a kaleidoscope and taped it to an orange juice con uh, ca container and stuck that on in front of the lens and would play a record and do funny things. So there was something to look at. And before, you know, it's, this is decades before social media, they didn't know if anybody was watching. He had a show from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, and they said, if you're watching, send in a postcard. And they were deluged with postcards. And they knew, oh my goodness, somebody's actually watching this. And that was actually the beginning of the Today Show, because no one knew that any television basically turned on at about 10.30. It was a test pattern before that. Yeah. And so they said, let's just try this Ernie guy. And he did it from 7 to 9. It was so successful that NBC took him off local television because they wanted to start a national show called the Today Show. With Dave so, Garraway, and that's yeah. why Ernie lost that job. I mean, Ernie, yeah. Ernie was somebody who, Ernie, none of his shows lasted anywhere more than a year and a half, but uh, he always turned up somewhere. He would lose a, a show somewhere. Yeah. He was always popular enough to be on the air, but not popular enough to have a long-running hit. But he went from, uh, from uh, CBS to Dumont to NBC to ABC uh, from one show to another and the f audience would always follow him and morning shows late night shows yeah. evening shows specials yeah so it wasn't like he was just doing you know an afternoon show or a talk show which uh, he probably would have done but he did yeah. game shows he did weird things but yeah he was always kind of a, a shark he was just always moving because he had that fertile sort of you know, yeah. creativity yeah can you, can you guys talk about, was there a particular segment or maybe a series of segments that you thought were particularly tragic that they were lost? And then what do you also feel was the most important thing that was saved from Ernie's work? Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, well, there's, there's a, mm, as far as what's lost, we have all the really, well, we don't know because it's stuff that's lost. We, we don't know how important it is. But, but there's, what survives with, as much as there's, uh, there's this piece of, 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 of history where we know that a lot of stuff was getting wiped. We do have uh, all of his ABC specials, the entire two season <coughs> one of Here's Edie e. Adams TV show, which she produced uh, as a way to get herself work, get herself back on the air almost immediately after the accident. Um, uh, so we really do have a lot of stuff. I think one, some of the more important things that have been saved is the the 1957 silent show um, in color, which survives in color. Um, and that, that's the show that kind of put him on the map. It got him the Life magazine cover, uh, got him a studio contract with Columbia. Uh, and I think between, it, it, Ernie Kovacs is sort of a, to me, Ernie Kovacs is a body of work kind of comedian. Um, you can, with other comedians, yes, yeah, you can show uh, safety Lass or The General with Harold Lloyd or Buster Keaton and get it. Uh, but the more Kovacs you see, uh, the more you understand his humor. It's, there's great stuff in this, this shows that survived from 1951 <coughs> uh, as well as the stuff right up to the very end, 1961. And the, the, the panel quiz show that Josh mentioned called Take a Good Look, it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a panel show where the get, there's a, a secret guest, a panel of celebrities are supposed to guess who this person is based on seeing video clues that Ernie has taped. None of it <laughs> makes sense. They are not clues in any way. A, it's a, like a three minute sketch, but the clock is at four o'clock, and this person who's the secret person has four brothers, and they, we're supposed to notice that. And it's like he's, the, he's like doing this inside joke with the audience at home, going, these people are never going to guess what's going on. <laughs> it's the most Dada uh, quiz show you've ever seen. And, it, and his show, when it was on ABC, uh, aired on Thursday nights at 10.30. And it was the, the bargain basement uh, time slot because it followed the untouchables. And so, uh, but he, he would have an idea and just go for it. And he had to do things his way. Well, my mom also maintained that with uh, Take a Good Look, here he was basically working for money because he didn't really want to do a game show, but they offered it to him and he needed the work. Uh, but that he was basically banking all of these clues to make a special 
that he would not have to actually be on. So he was actually creating two shows while he was doing <coughs> one show. So it was a very weird way of working, but in Ernie land, I think that made yeah. a lot of sense to him. Yeah. And uh, I think at the end, he was very much getting tired of performing. So he really wanted to be behind the camera, and he wanted yeah. a lot of technical things. So it was a way of creating content uh, yeah. to assemble later and make a special out of. Yeah. And he wound up a lot of the stuff that's on the ABC specials. If you're familiar with them, all the this oscilloscope blackout gag sequences are actually clues from Take a Good Look. And the version of the Nairobi Trio that most people know um, was actually a clue uh, from Take a Good Look. The, the, the secret guest had, was a man with a furniture factory who had hired three chimpanzees to help in the factory. <laughs> and this was supposed to be a clue. And it was aired in 1960, but they needed an extra few minutes uh, to fill out the very last episode of, of Ernie's uh, specials. And that got repurposed. So even posthumously, yeah. <laughs> take a good look clues got uh, yeah. stuffed into another show. So yeah. let me just interject here that um, right after this at 7.30 at Alamo Draft House in Richardson, there are a few seats left and we're, there, we're doing an Ernie Kovacs uh, retrospective and Josh and, and Ben will be talking to Bart. Um, so we'll get even more of all of this and you'll actually be able to see Ernie. We always have clips of Ernie playing, you know, it's like a seven, eight minute, you know, clip reel uh, playing before the, the, um, uh, before the, the award show, but this is like a full, a full retrospective so you can get a sense of who he is. Yeah. Um, uh, let me go ahead and bring up Ron. Yep. Ron, if you'll sure. join the gentleman. Very well done. Oh, awesome. Am I supposed to compete? So, with that? Yes. so what's, what is, what's interesting about Ron when we were talking about you know bringing in John Clayson and I want I want him to tell the story of why he's here, but Ron loved Ernie Kovacs. Is that first, correct? My first show. Yeah. Mm. So, first thing I'm watching. will you tell just a little bit about who you are and um, like your background? And All and then we've <laughs> <laughs> only got a minute. Ah no! I spent. Uh, I went to Southern Methodist University, graduated from seminary, <clears throat> and uh, that's why I became a comedian. First <laughs> <laughs> there. That's right. That's right. Uh, no, I eventually uh, went into uh, television. And uh, worked with Jim Blair uh, on Newsroom. That's how I really got my start as a news reporter, uh, covering the war on poverty with the Johnson administration uh, introduction into America, and it uh, did some great things. Uh, from that, uh, they decided that maybe I should become the program manager. And, uh, what year was that? Uh, that would have been uh, 1974. 74, 73, when I was So you started that K-Hearing? Yeah, as program manager, right. Did and you start at K-Hearing when, uh, when it started? 1970. Yeah, that was the first year. I had never been a reporter, and Jim Lehrer said, well, if you want this job, uh, I'll hire you. He said, well, I'm going to tell you now that top dollar for you is going to be $10,000 a year. So uh, I said, well, better than trying to sell pizza because I don't have a job. <laughs> and he hired me. And uh, from there, uh, I did fairly well on Newsroom. We had a good reporting team. It was a great group. A few, uh, that's back in 1970, so I don't know how many of you were watching it. I think I knew about it. But uh, A.C. Green was a great reporter. Came out of one of the news uh, areas here. Uh, Jim Lair, of course, was from Dallas Times Herald. Uh, highly regarded reporter. He was the editor of Newsroom. Uh, John Tackett, Billy Porterfield, great reporters, came out of Detroit Free Press down to Texas. He was from Texas originally. Uh, and Lee Cullen, who was fantastic, still is. Uh, so it, it was a really very uh, heralded group of reporters, and I was privileged to be in that group. I really learned a lot from but uh, 
I got a little tired of doing the recording uh, and uh, was thinking what I might like to do next. And Bob, uh, Bob Wilson called me in the office one day and he said, I'd like you to take over programming for the station. I said, ooh, that's great. He said, that's a salary increase, right? He said, yeah. <laughs> a bit. And uh, so I started working with him. Bob and I were big friends because we were both big Boston Red Sox fans. That was one thing we had going for us. And I uh, actually went up to Boston for a couple of games during that time. Uh, but the, uh, the program managing was also a new uh, drill for me. I liked it. Uh, trying to attract an audience. Uh, I was always interested in entertainment. That's why I started. I don't know how I went through the seminary, but that's when I started. <laughs> As I said, uh, the Ernie Kovacs show, I thought it was 1952 when I saw the mm -hmm. first Kovacs shows. And uh, God, I was just knocked out by it. And I haven't seen a single episode or anything from Ernie Kovacs since then. Mm -hmm. These are the four things I remember. Uh, he is walking on stage, there's a huge stone with a mermaid sitting there. He walks past it, he's always doing this to the audience, and he gets on the other side of the stone and you hear a splash. He looks back, he looks at the audience, and he keeps walking. Visual, but the impact of it is hysterical. There was this woman sitting up on this high thing, and suddenly she falls into the water. Mm -hmm. Nobody says a thing. <laughs> and the uh, Indy 500 race car driver. I thought that was amazing. I mean, he had about five, ten seconds of him trying to start his car. And he did it twice, or maybe three times, I think twice in the first segment. Sure. And then the next week, and about five minutes into the show, there was that guy trying to start his car. He was guaranteed to win that particular year. And, uh, to me, that was really cool. The other was the Nairobi Trio, which knocked me flat. I mean, it was hysterical. So Kovacs, uh, all over the library, he had a marvelous segment. Mm -hmm. He goes for the books, yeah. and you see the title. He wants to know what the audience thinks. He puts it back. And then he comes to one. What was the title of the one woman dies of? Camille. Oh, Camille. <laughs> <laughs> and the big cough comes out, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all visual comedy. And that's what I remember Kovacs for, is visual yeah. comedy. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Pythons. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to repeat what I said to uh, Robert Polanski. Uh, <coughs> Well, the Dallas Morning News you know, was printed, but a part of it. Uh, we got, I, I got this call from New York from this uh, guy that I had bought many programs from for the uh, PBA, for uh, KERA. And he said, we got a show here, and he said, uh, we can't sell it. Wendy, that was the guy's name. And he said, uh, and he told me, he said, he, he had sold us a lot. He, he told me the truth. He said, we can't sell it. He gave me these stories about where he had taken it and what they had done. They all turned white and they walked out. <laughs> so I said, God, it sounds perfect for KERA. <laughs> <laughs> and he shipped all of the cassettes. And I walked in Friday morning, Wednesday he called, Friday they were there, lined up against my wall. You remember those cassettes about that mm -hmm. big, like that wide, you know, like that? It was a bunch. So I said, well, that's a Saturday uh, job, and I came in Saturday, and I started watching the shows, and uh, I mean, I was in tears <laughs> when I finished one show, and then I sat there and I watched, and my then, uh, about to be my wife, uh, Linda, we were going to have dinner uh, that night, and uh, I realized was hearing these pebbles hit the window of the studio. <laughs> and I went to the window and she was sitting there, what about that? <laughs> it was five o'clock. I had been there all day watching the shows. And so I, I became a fan uh, instantaneously. <clears throat> I never have uh, ceased to be so. 
their use of the language. Uh, who would have ever thought of doing a cheese shop sketch? <laughs> 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 not a damn piece of cheese. <laughs> He just didn't know where it was going. Surely he was going to find something. And old Palin just sat there and said, not today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, their language, uh, it was a Churchill said that two great countries are separated by a common language. <laughs> the Brits have a way with language. They really do. They're masters of language. They love them. They love language. And they study it. And they become quite proficient in the use of the English language. And they could twist it in ways that make things funny, just by the way they use the, uh, the words and the descriptions of what they're doing and what they're talking about. But I, uh, I, I saw the, uh, uh, the Lumberjack song. <laughs> when I saw that, I had literally fell on the floor. <laughs> and I said, oh, God. What's Bob Wilson going to do? <laughs> That's when I knew that uh, I wanted the shows and I had to soften up the scenery for Bob so that he would go for it. And I knew Bob had a great sense of humor, so that was not a problem. But maybe this was getting a little too far out <laughs> for the Dallas audience. I mean, this was 1974, and the city was very conscious of its uh, image. Very conscious, and I'll even say conservative. And uh, we'd be flying into territory that I don't think had been on television, uh -huh. certainly not in Dallas and not in America, as evidenced by the fact that I knew that WTTW, where Second City was born, had turned it down. San Francisco had turned it down. Los Angeles had turned it down. Boston had turned it down. WNET New York had turned it down. So it was risky. I just knew that by virtue of the history of its uh, path through America and lack of broadcast. So I called him and told him I wanted to meet with him Monday morning. And Mike Ritchie, a buddy of mine, that's another guy who was on Newsroom. He and I were very good friends. Uh, he had a raging sense of humor, and I knew he'd like it. So I wanted him in the room when we showed the shows that were episodes. And I picked two. Uh, I had to show him the uh, Lumberjack song, and uh, then I picked the cheese shop to sort of make sure that there was going to be at least a Twitter. <laughs> Well, we didn't get halfway through the Lumberjack song. And Bob literally throws the notebook. He always brought a notebook to take notes to, to remember what he wanted to say about the, anything he was studying or, or working on. Threw it all the way across the room and was on his knees laughing. Hallelujah, we were out there. Picked up the phone and uh, he went out of the office laughing. Bob, Mike went out of the office laughing. and. Uh, I called uh, I called New York and I said we want them all, <laughs> and they gave us a really good price. Really, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so that we had that plus on our side, dirt cheap, and we were going to get them all, and we did. And I don't remember when we scheduled them. It's been too long ago. It was not very long after we got them. Who knows the date? When was it first on? It was a '74, I think. Yeah, Maybe '74. '74. And uh, they ran. Bob went to the board meeting, and they didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, I was outside in the newsroom listening and the, trying to hear if somebody laughed or what was going on. I heard not a word. I sat two hours listening to this, nothing. He comes out. They all come out. They all come out. Uh, Betty Marcus comes out. She waves. That was a good sign. Uh, Bob came out, he was a little white, I mean, he wasn't smiling, I'll put it that way. And I asked him, I said, Bob, how did it go? He said, they didn't walk out. I said, did anybody laugh? He said, well, Betty Marcus laughed. I said, oh, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, Bob, but there were 30 board members. 
uh, I think at that point he might have been a little nervous. And I, I was real nervous. We put it on, we played. The, you, you get the ratings, the Nielsen ratings, but then we only got it uh, four times a year. November, wow. February, uh, May, and uh, maybe July. Uh, the book came out. We were sweating the whole time because we didn't get much reaction on the phones from it. We didn't know what was going on, who was watching. And he came down the hall and he had the thing in his hand. He said, well, he said, I haven't looked, but the verdict's in. And I literally am sitting there wondering. I said, if this thing bombs, man, I'm dead. <laughs> Forget about it. It was your idea to be <laughs> And uh, the numbers were great. We had, uh, we usually had a 1, 1.25, maybe a 2, 2.5. Uh, the first night was a 6, wow. then it went to a 7. And uh, I don't remember if in the first month we had a 9, but we got a 9. Mm. And that was the night that we beat uh, uh, three of the networks. You had the Independent, and you had ABC, NBC, and CBS, and PBS. And we were number two. So that was extraordinary. Now it was late night stuff, which is not the most popular place on the planet for television and for the radio books. Uh, that's the history of the start of it. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of credit for it. And I thought it was ill deserved. I thought somebody would have found the shows later uh, when things uh, cooled off a bit. They were going to do more movies. And there he is, right back there. Now. Uh, I'm talking about you, John. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> you want me to uh, go down to this in empty chair? That sure. Come on, John. Here's the man. Hey, look, I've had this tail infected for eight months. And of course, the only thing that really, really helps it is if I don't walk a bit. Well. But it's very hard walking without your foot. <laughs> if it was on the end of my arm, and I just told you some people put it in a sleep. I just promised them you were going to do one city walk. No. Oh, that's right. No. <laughs> but all my artificial joints. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. I got three. October 27, 1930. Yeah. What are you? February 3rd, 1936. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's really old. <laughs> Can you hear me all? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> He's on my good ear, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, these guys are interested in how it all got started and are in love with the Pythons. And you guys have made a great reputation for yourselves. Done movies, done it all. In Dallas, yeah. What the hell? Yeah, well, Dallas was your start. It, it, it really was a rough start, wasn't it? Well, we, the show was, was in America. I'm mean, going yeah. to tell you, I mean, when, when we started Python, people couldn't make any sense of it, most people. That's, that's what made it so great. I know. <laughs> and it was terribly funny. And when I, even now, when I show clips from Python, and I have the light from the screen, I can watch the first two or three rows, and some people are laughing hysterically. <laughs> and then there's always two like that. <laughs> You're just trying to understand it, you know? <laughs> and you can't prove it's funny if you don't think it's funny. It's, it's not funny to you. <laughs> and, and there was a lot of confusion when we first went out. The critics, you see, they can only spot things that are 10% original. They never spotted if it's really original, so they didn't really write reviews of us except to say what was in the show, but they never committed themselves about whether it was good or bad. And the first series in England passed almost unnoticed. And then at the beginning of the second series, a guy called Alan Carr, who was the editor of Punch, you know, long mm -hmm. defunct yeah. funny magazine, right. gave us a great review in the Times, and it suddenly all changed, and everybody started to think it was good. But then <laughs> after about two years, 
we heard that somebody was coming from America to see whether they might want to put it on American television. It was from WGBH. <laughs> I always remember that one because in England it means with grievous bodily harm. <laughs> <laughs> And this very nice young guy arrived from Boston and she introduced and we went into a little screening room about as big as this and we sat and we watched the shows and then the lights went up and uh, he had he had got this color. <laughs> <laughs> you saw his career disappearing into the distance and he could hardly speak and he just wanted to get out of there as fast as he could. So we all said, well, we'll never be on American television. Mm. And then a lovely woman called Nancy Lewis, who loved our stuff, which in those days was here on record, but not in any other way. She started talking to people in the music business. And then uh, the wonderful Ron de Villiers. <laughs> he, uh, he was, um, he and his, you know, said, well, don't tell him. I mean, you were talking to your friends about, you all wanted to put it out. You were all. Well, the, the true story about, behind it is you had program managers, like the guy in uh, Chicago who was dying to put it on, and they killed it. So management could kill it. Really? And the Boston now, what, guy, did they, ever give, it it. did they ever give, give a reason? I mean, was it too shocking, or were they getting too many? thought it was too rude. It was that. It wasn't that it was subversive. Yeah. No, not subversive in that way. Because you see, we're wildly popular in Eastern European countries. <laughs> <laughs> because during the, 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 the time they were under Russian domination, mm -hmm. the Russians allowed Monty Python, and the Python was seen as anti-authority mm -hmm. and subversive. Mm -hmm. And so in Hungary and uh, in, in Bosnia, I was in Sarajevo, they told me this, they all saw it as the subversive, the thing that united them, a, a sort of subversion of the Russian government. It's the best they could do. I didn't realize it. Yeah. 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 But they, it was rude. It was negative. <laughs> <laughs> naked people. Intentionally rude. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. But then, you summoned up courage. <laughs> yeah. Summoned up courage? Well, I mean, you yeah, put it down. It didn't, didn't take courage. I mean, I was dying to put it on. It was easy. It was yeah, but what did, you, what did you think was going to happen? I was, I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you, you think you were going to get stoned on the way? Uh, I mean, in, in the physical yeah. sense. <laughs> that time, Dallas, we had things going on that were you know, getting pretty dicey. Yeah. yeah it was, uh, it, it was burning crosses. I, I thought it, <laughs> I didn't see any crosses. Before. We we didn't get threatening notes. Did no, you? Yeah, but not on that newsroom. Got a lot of threatening notes because they were covering things that had not been covered in Dallas before. Really? Tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth. But when you saw it on camera, we suddenly started seeing a lot of people showing up with news cameras. Really? Uh, and well, that's why we did so well with uh, Holy Grail, because that when that opened in New York, we were lucky because you guys had just preceded us. Yeah, it just gone. Because you know, right. knew us, and then suddenly, thanks to him, yeah. in Dallas, uh, people began here, and then we started going out in the stations all over America, and then we opened the Holy Grail, and we got this this tremendous uh, response. You had a fabulous yeah. review in the New Yorker. Uh, really? The Holy Grail. Yeah. I forgot that. Right. Yeah. The guy said that everybody was saying that the exit lights were, say, were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the great uncle, you never seen it? Oh, I, I may have seen it. Someone uh, was this 1930 what? <laughs> 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 you never forget. 1930. Uh, but we bought in the same decade. Yeah. 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 We had that in common.
They said, you don't need to come. <laughs> the protesters have done the job for you. Because they started protesting before it had even opened. You see? And they were outside. I remember somebody had a big sign saying, Monty Python is the agent of the devil. <laughs> I remember thinking, I wouldn't mind being on 10% of what he <laughs> Because of that, the news cover, new evening news was started, I started to cover them, and then it became a story on its own, so we didn't actually have to do any public. <laughs> it's lovely when that happens. Yeah. John, can you talk about what it means to you on a personal level when when Ron came to you and, and decided to air this? And what that meant to you as a Well, well don't forget, this all happens at a great distance. Right. Yeah. You know, people always think in this business that you know what's going on, but the answer is they, they don't tell you. I mean, it's quite an interesting experience when you finish a movie because everyone's terribly nice to you. And then you cease to exist. You go back to the trailer and you take the makeup on, you get in the car, and then you'll never hear a word from them until they want you for publicity. But they never say we finished filming or we're very happy with it or these scenes work particularly well. They just forget completely about you. So we just knew that something extraordinary had happened and we were so starved it was Dallas. <laughs> you know, because in England in the old days, we thought people in Dallas basically ate their own children. <laughs> <laughs> but as a performer, I mean, it had to be a big victory, I would imagine, because this well, meant... Well, don't this... think this is after it had finished in England. Absolutely, yeah. Know. But now that meant you were, like, global. You were on a global scale. Yes, but we never really fought like that. We okay. were just delighted. And when we thought, well, that's really nice, because now we'll be able to make another film. Yeah. <laughs> because this has been successful. So we then wrote a script that we thought was really good, which was Life of Brian. Right. Yeah. And we couldn't find anybody who would give us the $3 million. It's not a lot of money for a movie. Not a lot at and all. And nobody would give it. We, we started in the UK, that was hopeless, and then we came here, and there was not a single Hollywood studio that would give us three million. Mm. And you know the story about George Harrison. You know, Eric gave him the script, and George laughed, and said he'd put the money up. And Eric called me. I was just going off to do a film with Peter Sellers in, in Vienna. Mm. Um, and uh, Eric said, we've got the money. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, George Harrison, I knew he knew him. And he yeah. said he was going to mortgage his house. And I said, I said, <laughs> I said why, why is he doing this? And he, Eric said, he said, I want to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in it, you know. He's in Mr. Papalopoulos, who, who leases the, uh, the mount. <laughs> so it was all happening without us really knowing about it. The Python films were four years together, uh, four years apart. Uh, sort of what is it, seventy? I don't have to stop before now. Seventy-eight, seventy-four, and eighty-two. Oh. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so before seventy-eight and eighty-two. So uh, we we never really knew what was going on. All we knew is that after the success of the Holy Grail, they wouldn't give us three million dollars to make a <laughs> Because you, 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 when you get older, you do realize that almost nobody in charge knows what they're doing. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, I tell this to people in the Except media, and they all know what I'm talking about. They have no fucking idea what they're doing. But the trouble is, they don't know that. <laughs> and this isn't a new idea because the best book ever written on Hollywood was written by a dear friend of mine who just died, Bill Goldman. Mm -hmm. And it called a big stir when it came out. It was, uh, it was what was it called? Stories in the, it was the Screen Trade. Yes, yes. yes. Adventures in the Screen Trade. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And, uh, and in it, Bill said, Nobody knows. And it caused a sort of interesting, mild scandal at the time that mm. anyone would say that. And of course it's absolutely true. There's a very good book called The Drunkard's Walk by Leonard Mlofsky, which is, he's a, it's about probability, but there's a three or four pages about movies. And but when you feed that, you realize nobody knows, you know? Somebody over there, they're hot at the moment, and then suddenly they have a bad slate of films, you know.
and then everyone says, oh, they can't do it anymore, and then the next slate that they'd already in place that they didn't have time to cancel is a huge success again. People, it's really worth reading on about the second chapter, I think it is. Leonard Lovin Oscar. <laughs> well, he, re he wrote a book with, with Stephen Hawking, so he's got to be pretty smart. Yeah. But it's just about statistics and, and about the fact that you never know what's going to work. I mean, I reach the point now. Actually, Bill Goldman told me an interesting story about Sondheim. He what? said, Sondheim said to him, uh, at this point in my career, I'm not going to write a bad song, but I might write the wrong song. Mm. Well, that for me is very interesting. Mm -hmm. You never, you might write the wrong song, and that kind of subtlety is what defeats most of the people in charge. Mm. John, can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind taking a few questions? That's my favorite, my favorite oh, line from Life of Brian. getting slapped around and nothing happens to him. Well, just put a cap on what you said. Thank God this guy knew what he was doing. I know. Yeah. I know. Bless no. him. Bless him. Mm -hmm. Would you mind taking sure. a few other questions? Mm -hmm. No. no okay. No. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Down here, John. Um, John, when you guys first started doing Python, did you think it was going to be as big of a success? Did you do it just for fun? Or how did it come about? Because in those days, I mean, it's quite genuinely, we were quite um, purist, pure in our motives. I mean, we worked for the BBC. We knew we would never make much money. I used to get 240 pounds a show. 240 pounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a series, I got four thousand pounds, including the writing. Mm -hmm. So we weren't doing it for the money, but we did it for the BBC. Although we could get more money at ITV because they had <coughs> a better track record on comedy. They had good directors and good floor managers. So we went to the BBC because they would make better programs, not because they give us more money. And we weren't terribly motivated by money because when I started, income tax top rate in England. 83%. That was Howard Wilson and the uh, Labour government. So nobody expected to make any money. We made a living, but we did it just because we loved, we loved to make each other laugh, really. And uh, we didn't ever know what the viewing figure was. What mattered was a thing called the AI, the Audience Appreciation Index. And we would be told that we got a 71, which was extraordinarily high. But we never knew how many people were watching it. Uh, the only answer was enough. <laughs> so when we started, we had no idea. And Michael and I, I can still, this is absolutely true. I remember standing with Michael sort of on the edge, on the side of the, 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 the set where Graham Chapman and Terry Jones were going to do a sketch about flying sheep. <laughs> and we, we stood there and I said to Michael, I said, Mickey, do you realize we could be the first comedy show in history to record a whole show to complete silence? And he said to me, I was having that thought. <laughs> and that's what, you know, we didn't know how people would respond to it. And uh, then on that particular sketch, people started giggling about it a third of the way through. And we looked at each other and thought, well, Maybe it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the head of department, Tom Sloan, walked into the elevator with the director, saw the director, and said, what are you doing with this awful program? <laughs> this is supposed to be funny. Mm -hmm. And then they had a departmental uh, heads meeting, eight of the, you know, who do children's sport, uh, drama, uh, all, all the different. Uh, departments of the BBC, six out of eight of them really didn't like it. So these are people at the, hop, at the top of their department. Wow. <laughs> yes, I had a question. I was wondering if you could share with us an actor or comedian who inspired you early on in your career. Well, you see, I didn't know I was ever going to go into this until my last year at Cambridge. The Footlights did this little review in the local professional theatre and somebody turned up and said they wanted to put it on in the West End. Now by that time I was 24, so I hadn't been thinking, you know, how am I going to... But I, I, you could tell, uh, we had a sitcom called Hancock's Half Hour with a fellow called Tony Hancock. 
And I remember once writing a line and thinking, that's familiar. That's a, and I realized it wasn't the line, it was the intonation, it was Tony Hancock's. In other words, it was still in my head 10 years later. Uh, but the, 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 the stuff that I liked the best, we all liked, the teenagers liked, was uh, the Goon Show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was wonderful. I mean, if you listen to that, so it's still the best use of, of, of radio for comedy that there's ever been. And we all loved that. And it was a little bit like Python. It was like a sort of little subversive society of people who liked it and who would uh, do it almost word for word the next day in the playground. It was, <laughs> that was exactly how we were with the... With the with the, the Goon Show, and I finished up actually doing a show with those guys. Mm -hmm. I played the announcer, Wallace Greenstein, and I was up there with <laughs> Peter Sellers, <coughs> and, uh, Harry Seacom, and, and, and Spike Milligan. Wow. So there were things going on, but I mean, a lot of the comedy we watched in those days there was the great early visual comedy, Sir Laurel and Hardy, and, and, and Chaplin, and Buster Keaton. Uh, Marx Brothers, and every couple of years in uh, my late teens I would discover somebody else like the Marx Brothers and suddenly think, who are these wonderful people? Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of American humor because we had Jack Burns, uh, George Burns, Jack Benny, uh, Phil Silvers, uh, Ames and Andrew, Ooh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, there was one other, uh, but, but we didn't have Ernie. We hardly saw any of it. I, I went to see a thing called North of Alaska. Yeah. It was the first time I ever saw it. And I thought, who is this marvelous man? Mm -hmm. We never had the honeymooners. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the show of shows. Mm -hmm. It was very strange that we didn't have these great shows, but we did have some. And most of the comedy I watched in those days, you know, when I'd done my prep, um, was, 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 was American. And Danny Kay was the big comedy in the mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we grew up very, very familiar with a lot of them. And then in the, my late teens, uh, I started hearing about Mort Saul mm -hmm. and Nichols and May and mm -hmm. Shelley Berman and Bob Newhart. And we started, that was records, you see. We weren't yeah. getting that stuff yeah. because a lot of them were in nightclubs. Right. Um, uh, so, so the American influence was very, very strong. And. Uh, you know, it still remains very right? you know, I, I think I almost automatically steal from anyone. I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like about comics, they do talk about stealing. You know, if I was an artist, I would say I was influenced by some. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Devin? When you look at the generations of children and teenagers who latch onto Monty Python and were now on like four different generations who can at rote quote the, the, the cheese shop sketch, the dead parrot, all the rest of it. When you look at the legacy of Python, is there one thing that you did as the troop that you wish had made it into that kind of pantheon? It's like, why did this sketch that we did? Well, you never knew. I mean, there were lines that I always liked that people didn't pick up. Um, there was a line in the Wizard Chocolate <laughs> factory. Where, remember when the, the hygiene inspector goes along and he says, "What's this? Uh, what's this sweet meat here? Spring surprise." And the guy said, "Well, when you bite into it, uh, steel bolts spring out from it. That's <laughs> right, your cheeks." And the hygiene officer says. Where's the pleasure in that? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever noticed. <laughs> but it is wonderful. What a very touching with so many of those phrases. What have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> I had a tiny minor accident with a golf cart on a Caribbean resort about a year ago, and the guy got out and says, Tis but a scratch. <laughs> that words have passed into the, uh, into the English language. Yeah, waffer, waffer thing. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? A favorite? Oh, God, John. Don't put me on the spot. All you right. did that to me once before. I know. Your it's favorite fair. sketch. Yeah. No, I just mean a line. One of, one of those. One line. Yeah. Well, I thought uh, from the movie. What did the Romans ever do? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. 
But that's very nice. But what I've realized much more in the last 10 years is the emotional effect or the emotional connection that people make with Python. Uh, we were, I was in Sarajevo and they were telling me about that. It was four years when the Serbians were up in the hills shooting civilians with sniper, you know, uh, lobbing bombs in. And they got an underground uh, garage and set up a, a, an old fashioned, you know, and they used to show Monty Python movies and they'd <laughs> creep in there after. And they wow. said, we came out feeling better. We didn't know why, but we felt better. Wow. And when you realize that wow. it's affected people in that way, and then when, when I do shows now, meet and greets afterwards, the, the men of 60, 70, 80, <laughs> <laughs> they say to me, thank you for making me laugh all these years. And often there's a tear in their eye. You see, I didn't know that when I was younger. You can see that there was something about the attitude. I'll tell you how you sum it up. Someone early on said to me, what I love about Monty Python is that after I've watched it, I cannot watch the news. I cannot take it seriously. And that, I think, is terribly important because we live in such a cesspit of a planet. <laughs> I can't see the funny side of it. Yeah. <laughs> no, what was that? The termite show The termites. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Now, that was the beginning of the Lima program. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a center that's of, right. of, of that's an right. ecological. Right, right, right. That's what it was. That's what it Can was. Can I go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so throughout the go, gentlemen, you did ask, did you? I can't remember. No, I did. I, I really had two questions. What, what is, were you influenced by Beyond the Fringe? By the? Beyond, Beyond the Fringe. Oh, enormously, yes. Because it looked like you did Beyond the Fringe, but on steroids. <laughs> well, I can, I'll tell you what happened, and it, uh, it's sociologically, it's very, very interesting. I saw Beyond the Fringe in Cambridge on its way into the West End. Mm -hmm. So I saw it about a month before it hit the West End. And I thought it was the funniest show I'd ever seen, and I still think that, because all of those performers were wonderful. Dudley, Peter, Alan Bennett, who's now one of our very best playwrights, and Jonathan Miller who died, you know, last week. Uh, I'd never seen a show so funny. Uh, to the point when a sketch finished, I would have a pang of sadness that it was yes, all. <laughs> and then the lights would come up and Jonathan and Peter would be there. Oh, you're right. <laughs> but when it got to London, and I thought it was the funniest show I'd ever seen, but that's what I thought. This is wonderful comedy. When it got to London, all the critics saw was that it was satire. And there hadn't been satire up to that point. Mm. Michael Frayne, the playwright, told me he was sitting in, in Beyond the Fringe in the West End, and there were a couple of sort of upper class man and woman there. And Peter came out and started doing Harold McMillan. And meet how, here and there. And he goes on like this as a doddery old idiot, and suddenly the person in front of Michael came to him, turned to the girlfriend and said, My God, he's doing the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you what it was like in those days. You didn't make fun of the Prime Minister, and they all collapsed, which is immediately after Beyond the Fringe had this enormous social impact. David Frost was on five, six months later doing that was the week that was. And it changed the face of Britain completely. It went from being very deferential to quite cheeky and fun. And that was hugely important. But the odd thing was, the, the Beyond the Fringe people didn't particularly see it as satire. And they just thought they were being funny. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they did sketches like uh, Death Penalty. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm curious, throughout the years, I, I'm sure people have asked you uh, for your advice, you know, as an actor or writer or whatever, And uh, but you've had such an interesting and, and different career path. I, I wonder what it is you say to people, because it's probably hilarious. Well, I, do, I, I say to actors, I say, find a scene with your favorite actor or actress and watch it until you get bored. Because when you are bored, when you're no longer affected by it emotionally, then you can see how it's done technically. 
But while you're feeling sad or laughing, you can't see it. It's like the emotional response gets in the way of the analysis. So you just have to keep on. I used to play Peter Cook and Dudley Moore sketches from uh, Not Only But Also. <laughs> and I would play the sketch, and then I would sit down and try to write it from memory. And of course, you think, well, no, and then you play it again. You think, oh, yeah, that, oh, that would have to go before that. And by doing that, until I could more or less write it out completely, it was a wonderful learning process. So I think take something that you love and look at it really carefully so that it's not affecting you emotionally anymore. Then you see the technique of it. And as a writer? Hmm? And as a writer? Well, you see, do, trying to remember the thing, trying to remember someone's sketch or something like that, or trying to remember a particular speech and trying to see why it works so well. That's that's all you can do, and and and, and you watch, try to watch the best people. Uh, because then the, the sad thing about getting older as a comic is that you do know most of the most of the jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, I had a, I'm sorry. Oh, I, right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So out of all of the production, out of all the movies, out of all the episodes, what is your favorite scene? I think it's a question of my mood. There are many favorite scenes. I don't want to say there's one that stands out, because if you ask me on one day, I might say something <laughs> different. I mean, I was watching last night, or two, no two nights ago, in Austin, I was watching some of the silliest things, and I was watching the fish slapping dog. And it still makes me laugh. I've seen it 300 times. And also, and also laughing at the people who were going... <laughs> but there isn't anything in particular. Uh, there's, there, uh, Forty Towers, which we don't talk about so much, there's two or three episodes there, the dead body, the rat, and the one where the anniversary goes wrong. Mm -hmm. I think those are, those are the three there. Uh, I think I, the second series is better than the first. I think Forty Towers was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was good, wasn't yeah. it? Little yeah. farces, little oh. thirty-minute farces. <laughs> Manuel, what did you find? <laughs> you know, guess where Andrew Sachs was born? Where? Germany. Who said that? Very <laughs> good. Berlin. Wow. Wow. He was yeah. Jewish and managed to get out in the mid thirties, and wow. he turned into the perfect English gentleman. You, know, <laughs> you never think he was an actor. You would think that he was a rather quiet and very smart bank manager. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing about him that was so busy. Was it done? Um, was a bank manager. Yeah. That kills me right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it, was it, he was wonderful. You put the moustache oh, on him oh, and oh, he oh, just changed it to someone oh, else. He was quite <laughs> extraordinary. His first language was German. Was it, um, was it either you or Andrew Sachs who suggested that Manuel be German? <laughs> At first, and then no, 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 no. He was, okay. It was always Spanish because just about the time I started that, the early seventies, uh, the the British uh, restaurateurs or restaurateurs decided that or discovered that if they used people who didn't speak English, they didn't have to pay them so much. Mm. Yeah. And there was a stage about 1973 when if you got went to an English restaurant, you got what you'd ordered, you were lucky. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that was just a manifestation of uh, making fun of the fact that he used this. And what's so important about him, he's a totally sweet person. Oh. He's keen, he wants to help. He never gets cross, he gets sad about his rat, but he's always totally positive. But if he wasn't, he wouldn't be so funny, you know. It's the purity. So, Mike? Yes, I had a question. I, I follow you on Twitter, so I have a bit of a clue. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about comedy today and maybe what people are missing in comedy today? versus what you have done in the past and what you've witnessed in the past. The great problem here is I don't watch much today. And it's partly that when you've done an awful lot of it, uh, you sort of know where a lot of stuff is going. So you think to yourself, yes, this is quite good. But I don't want to watch it for an hour. 
you, you see, but when you discover somebody, the last person I remember discovering was Bill Hicks. Oh, yes. yes. And when I saw Bill Hicks, I thought, who is this guy? Where has he been? But I haven't had that experience, whereas in my late teens, I was discovering, one day I discovered Buster Keaton. I'd only heard about Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy, and suddenly Buster Keaton, and you watch these films, and this treasure trove was opened up. So I find that the people who make me laugh now, there's a lot of good stand-ups. Uh, but I think Eddie Izzard is my, my, my uh, hero, because he tells me he really doesn't know what he's going to say. I think that's a lot. I think you had your hand, did you put a hand up there somewhere? I, I yeah. don't want the German thing, it's my only question. Um, <laughs> uh, this is for Ron and John. I mean, when, when you think about it, Ron, I mean, you were responsible for bringing, like, this huge comedy movement to America that, you know, made satire mainstream and, you know, elevated comedy to a new kind of level of consciousness. You know, how does it feel to look back at that and realize that, that that you brought that, like we wouldn't, we wouldn't have nerds at conventions saying me, you know, if you had, if you had brought gumbies, that. Gumbies, gumbies. Yes, yeah, yeah, so we wouldn't have gumbies. Like, I mean, I mean, how does it feel to realize that, like, you brought something to America that that changed uh, art and comedy? I'm pretty damn proud of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a good movie, and uh, I liked it then. I like it now. Yeah. I uh, like it when I say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, I think it helped Dallas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the Dallas folk are very proud. Um, you know? yeah. And I'm absolutely delighted about that because it, when I ask people when the first time I say Dallas, people go, oh, oh. And yeah. I go, and I, I was absolutely splendid that you led the way. I was just wondering what you thought of uh, Tracy Ullman's show. You know, I've hardly watched it. I think she's the most <laughs> wonderful. But this is the trouble. I hardly watch comedy now because it's very unusual to see something that excites me. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And I have a small list of things um, that, uh, that I want to watch when I get round to it. But uh, what I feel now is there were so many good writers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, who knew how to construct stuff. The, the construction of comedy was far more sophisticated then than it is now. Mm -hmm. If you look at the sort of um, uh, hangover movie, the, mm -hmm. the sad thing is that it's about sex and drugs and booze and celebrity and gambling. You see what I mean? Yeah. Which is what a lot of young people now seem to know about. And I always wanted to make a film called 1776 and a Half. <laughs> <laughs> because I th think that, 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 you know, there's a lot of fun to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly the fact that most of the English uh, soldiers were German. Oh, <laughs> and Brunswick and Hesse. And 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 yeah, so. yeah, yeah, it's terribly <laughs> funny. So I wanted to start with these German mm. soldiers talking yeah, to each yeah. other. You see, and then you the American French is the first thing they say is, God, our British. <laughs> <laughs> what, in that vein, what's the funniest Monty Python sketch mm. that nobody ever got to see? Oh, oh I don't think it was one. Well, it was a very good one with uh, me as a sculptor and... No, no, Graham was the sculptor, me as a... as his subject. <laughs> and he done a perfectly good sketch. Have you ever seen it? No, I didn't see that. He Why done a perfectly it? good uh, uh, sculpture of me, but my nose was about six inches. <laughs> and he unveiled it and said, well, what do you think? You know, you know how you, you never criticize anyone's work. <laughs> you know, I start to say, well, I'm, I'm, he couldn't finish it because Gray was in his drunken phase and he couldn't get the lines right. He had literally abandoned it. But there was never a good sketch that we that we threw out. That the censors threw out? Say again? That the censors threw out? 
That's what he just asked. Uh, well, there was never a sketch censorship. that the censors threw out? Well, the censors were the BBC, and I thought they were perfectly sensible. I mean, I was a little more conservative than the others. I thought sometimes the BBC were right to say no. I mean, Gilliam, who is, I think his, his, his aim sometimes is to shock rather than to entertain. Uh, he, he did, a, he did a, an animation with Christ being uh, crucified on a telegraph pole. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do it now, but, well, I don't know. I don't know what you can do anymore, because the PC people seem to be a threat to culture, you know. Well, we need to wrap it up. Um, so oh. Would you mind taking? Oh, I know. I'm no. sorry, John. <laughs> I got to tell one story. Okay. And, <laughs> and, so one story. Well, okay. 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 I want to take some pictures no. too, and then. What he did? What he did? Quick. Yeah. I started a company, distribution company, worldwide. We had very few shows. I tried to get the Pythons to represent their shows worldwide when I went into business. That was 1981, 82. And it didn't work out too well right at first. One day I got a call from London. He said, come over. Uh, we have to talk to you. It'll be of interest. We had about $5,000 in the bank as a company. So I said, I'm coming. <laughs> I went. They had a meeting. They were all sitting around the table. I was in a chair right in the middle of the room. And I said, I want to represent the shows. And what do you think? And they had already decided. And they said, yeah. Okay, that's, we want you to do it, Ron. We want you to do it. And John's sitting at the end of the table. I have one suggestion <laughs> before you can distribute our shows. The name of our company was De Villiers Donegan Enterprises. You have to change the name of your, pro, your uh, company to... Uh, Ron's TV sales. <laughs> you did that. You did that. You broke up everybody. So we had some fun. I remember once we had to set up some company for uh, an American uh, um, accountants were setting up something uh, which was favorable from a tax point of view, and they said to us, you know, yeah, can, can we have a number, you know, like accountants always do, can we have it now in three minutes? And we said we want it to be called Evado Tax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, thank you for coming. Well,